Hi everyone. Today we're going to cover Chapter 7, Maternal, Infant, and Child Health. Here are the objectives for the chapter. In this chapter, we present a health profile of mothers, infants, and children. Infants are those that are younger than one year, and children refer to ages one through nine years. In the following two chapters, the health profiles will be presented for adolescents and young adults and adults and older adults or seniors. Various sources may group ages differently to describe and measure health status, but in this book, we're going to refer to them as children, one through nine, and infants, less than one year. And this is consistent with the World Health Organization and a lot of public health professionals. So maternal, infant, and child health, often abbreviated MIC, encompasses the health of women of childbearing age from pre-pregnancy, through pregnancy, labor, and delivery, and the postpartum period, and the health of the child prior to birth through adolescence. Maternal, infant, and child statistics are important indicators of the effectiveness of disease prevention and health promotion services in a community. We know that unintended pregnancies, late or no prenatal care, poor maternal and child nutrition, maternal drug use, low immunization rates, poverty, limited education, and insufficient child care, combined with a lack of access to health care services, are precursors precursors to high rates of maternal, infant, and childhood morbidity and mortality. And just as a reminder, morbidity refers to having diseases and mortality refers to death. And we know that a lot of these factors can be reduced or prevented with the early intervention of educational programs and preventative medical services for women's infants and children. So overall, in the United States, we have had a decline in the maternal, infant, and child mortality in recent decades, but there are significant challenges remaining, the first of which is significant racial disparities. So if you remember from previous lessons, a disparity refers to a significant difference between groups. So this could be a gender disparity. Right? For example, right, women are more affected by breast cancer than men, right? by a huge margin, so that would be a gender disparity. But here we're talking about racial disparity, so it's different between races. And what we need to talk about is the continual and substantial disparity between mortality, right, death rates, for white and black mothers. So the mortality rate among infants of black mothers was 11.1 .1 per 1,000. This is from 2013. And that's over two times the rate of infants among white mothers and Hispanic mothers, which is about five per 1,000. So this means that the death rate among infants, remember, less than one year old, is twice that for black mothers than it is for white and Hispanic mothers. Now the pregnancy-related mortality ratio, which is a maternal death or the death of a mother within one year after pregnancy, okay, that was related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or how the pregnancy was handled. So we, we know that it's, the death is due to pregnancy. Okay. And this death ratio among black women is 38.9 per 100,000 live births. And that's about three times the rate among white women, which is 12 per 100,000 live births. And this is during, this data is from 2006 to 2010. So specifically, these live births refer to successful births, right? Births that ended in a healthy child, or at least in a live child. So these disparities may not be directly attributable to race or ethnicity, although certain diseases do occur more often among individuals of certain races or ethnicities, but it's most likely due to the background factors that we've discussed before. So here we have a graph of infant mortality rates by race, infant mortality rates by race, and Hispanic origin of the mother. And this is from 2005 and 2013. And you can see that overall the rates are decreasing, but we still have a large disparity with black women. 
This is death rates for infants per 100,000 over selected years from 1980 to 2013. Now again, we have a total overall decline, but we still have higher rates than is ideal. And here there's a really informative chart. So this is a comparison of national infant mortality rates from 2010. So here we have an array of countries. Right? And you can see the lowest rate on this chart is Finland. So they have uh, an infant mortality rate of two per 1,000 live births. And then in the United States, we have six per 100, or excuse me, six per 1,000 live births. So the United States, although a wealthy and developed nation, has the rates of undeveloped nations. Here are the death rates among children ages five to 14 by race and Hispanic origin. And again, you can see that black is at the top. And then we have Asian, Asian slash Pacific Islander at the bottom. And then the orangish yellow one with the triangles in the middle is the average. So this is a really important box from the book and it shows rates for each day in America for all children. And I think this provides an overall synopsis of maternal infant and child health in the united states so every single day two mothers die in childbirth four children are killed by abuse or neglect five children or teens commit suicide seven children or teens are killed by guns 24 children or teens die from accidents 66 babies die before their first birthday 187 children arrested for violent crimes 408 children are arrested for drug crimes 838 public school students are corporally punished. 847 babies are born to teen mothers. 865 babies are born at low birth weight. 1,241 babies are born without health insurance. 1,392 babies are born into extreme poverty. 1,837 children are confirmed as abused or neglected. 2,723 babies are born into poverty. 2,857 high school students drop out, 4,028 children are arrested, 4,408 babies are born to unmarried mothers, 16,244 public school students are suspended. So even with the slight decline we have in mortality rates, there is so much to be done to improve the health of American children. First, right, based on the last slide, we need to recognize that children today face other concerns that put them at risk for poor health. These concerns have been referred to as the new morbidities and include their family, social environments, behaviors, economic security, and education. So now we're going to discuss family and reproductive health. And families are the primary unit in which infants and children are nurtured and supported regarding healthy development. And there are various definitions of family as this concept has changed over time, depends on social and cultural norms and values, and may be conceptualized differently on an individual basis. The US Census Bureau defines a family as a group of two people or more, one of whom is the householder, related by birth, marriage, or adoption, and residing together. All such people are considered as members of one family. Another definition of family is two or more persons who are joined together by bonds of sharing and emotional closeness who identify themselves as being part of the family. With delays in childbearing and increases in cohabitation, along with changes in societal norms related to having children outside of marriage, the percentage of births to unmarried women has risen over the past several decades. Now it's important to notice this, okay? So just because we refer to a birth or a pregnancy as occurring to an unmarried woman that does not mean that she does not have you know a spouse a partner someone supporting her just as much if not more than a husband would right so unmarried doesn't reflect the negative association we tend to think of it with right lots of people cohabitate people are getting married later this is not a negative thing so just keep that in mind when we talk about unmarried births and pregnancies that doesn't automatically mean negative, okay? All right, so unmarried births, right, going off of that, 
uh, also vary among other population subgroups. So in 2013, 35% of births to white women were out of wedlock, meaning they were unmarried, and 71% of births to black women were out of wedlock, as in they were unmarried. And again, remember, unmarried includes both women who are single and those are who, who are cohabitating with the father of their child or with another partner. Unmarried women are more likely than married women to experience negative birth outcomes. Married women are more likely than unmarried, non-cohabitating women to initiate prenatal care early in pregnancy. Okay, so married women are more likely to get medical care earlier in pregnancy. And married women are also less likely than unmarried, non-cohabitating women to rely on government assistance to pay for prenatal care, excuse me. Now, teenage births, teenage pregnancies more likely are more likely to result in serious health consequences for both the mother and the baby. Teen mothers are less likely to receive early prenatal care, and teen mothers are more likely to smoke during pregnancy, have preterm birth, have low birth weight babies, and have pregnancy complications. And one fourth or a quarter, 25% of teenage girls get pregnant at least once before age 20. Right. So teenage birth does come or teenage pregnancy comes along with a negative, a lot of negative consequences, right? They're typically less educated just because of their age. They're less likely to be independent and get the medical care they need. They're less likely to be able to afford the medical care they need. Right? There's just a lot that goes into teenage pregnancies and a lot of it can really impact the development of the fetus and the health of the mother. So here we have selected characteristics by age of the mother in the United States for 2010. So in orange, we have mothers aged 15 to 19 years old. And in pink, we have mothers aged 20 to 44 years old. So this is a huge uh, difference, right? We have teen pregnancies and then non-teen pregnancies. And you can see that the teen pregnancies were more likely to have no prenatal care in the first trimester. And this is one of the most important time of development occurs, right? This is the most dangerous part of your pregnancy. You can say 43% of them did not get prenatal care in the first trimester. 12% smoked. 14% had a preterm birth, meaning they gave birth early. And 10% had a low birth weight. So unfortunately, the adverse consequences related to teen pregnancy do not end when the child is born. Right? There are still more consequences. Teenagers who become pregnant and have a child are more likely than their peers who are not mothers to drop out of school, not get married, or to have a marriage ending in divorce. They're more likely to rely on public assistance and live in poverty. It's difficult to determine the actual impact, the total impact of teen pregnancy, because women, the women who do face educational, economic, and social hardships that may be more likely to experience a teen pregnancy in the first place. So though, although teen childbearing may not be the sole cause of these hardships, it does make it more difficult to overcome them. Right? It's a lot more difficult to get out of poverty when you have a dependent or even multiple dependents. Okay. Children born to teenage mothers have an increased risk of being abused or neglected and of experiencing lower educational attainment. They're less likely to advance academically. Sons of teen mothers are more likely to be imprisoned at some point, and daughters are more likely to become teenage mothers themselves when compared with children born to older mothers. Teenage pregnancy and childbearing also have substantial economic consequences for society. In 2010, teenage childbearing cost payers, taxpayers at least $9.4 billion in costs associated with health care, foster care, incarceration, and lost tax revenue. The consequences of teen childbearing make it clear that teenage pregnancies are a significant community health concern in the United States. Teen pregnancy and birth rates have declined steadily in recent years. 
in large part as a result of effective community and public health campaigns aimed at reducing teenage pregnancies. So although earlier I mentioned that unmarried pregnancies are not isn't exactly a negative connotation, right? People consider it negative, but it doesn't automatically assume that the situation is negative. But when we talk about teenage pregnancies, this is something we really want to reduce, okay? It's dangerous, it has lots of consequences, and it can make it really difficult for the mother and the child to have a high quality of life. Between 1991 and 2013, the teenage birth rate in the United States has declined by 57%, to 26.5 births per 1,000 teenagers. And every year in the United States, we have 273,105 teen pregnancies per year. Now the choice to become a parent is a critical decision that affects the individual and the community. People who become parents acquire the majority responsibility for another human being, and this needs to be recognized. Right? They must provide an environment conducive to child development and one that protects and promotes health. It's not a decision to be made lightly or to be done just because that's the normal thing to do, right? You want to make sure you're really prepared financially, especially. So family planning gives individuals and couples the ability to determine the number and spacing of their children. Okay, so family planning refers to determining, do you want children, right? Yes or no? How many children would you like to have? Blah, blah, blah. H how far apart would you like to have these children, right? So it's really consciously thinking about it. And if you're deciding not to have children or you're deciding not to have children right now, you're taking action towards that, okay? So for example, if Susan wants to have a child after she's been working in a solid career for five years at least, right? She'll get on birth control until that time comes. Okay. Or if I know I do not want children, I never want to have children, I can get on some type of birth control, I can make sure that I'm using some sort of contraceptive, maybe even a long-term contraceptive. Okay. So it's just consciously deciding what you want to do and then implementing that. And as I said earlier, right, deciding whether or not to become a parent is an important and consequential decision. Right? I really want to emphasize this. Parenthood requires enormous amounts of time, energy, and financial commitment, but most notably, it requires the willingness to take full responsibility for a child's growth and development. And planning a pregnancy is the first step to ensuring the best health for the mother and the fetus during pregnancy. Right? The more planned it is, the better the outcomes will be. Right now, approximately one half of all pregnancies in the United States are unintended. Right. You can say accidental, but unintended is the correct term. And about 43% of those end in abortion. The United States has set a national goal of increasing the percentage of pregnancies that are intended to 56 by 2020. And that is a part of the Healthy People 2020 agenda we've discussed. Okay. So community involvement in family planning and care includes governmental and non-governmental organizations. Now, as I said earlier, about half of all pregnancies in the U.S. are unintended, and almost half of those end in abortion. So an unintended pregnancy refers to one that is unwanted, right, as if the mother does not, or woman does not want to be pregnant, or mistimed, meaning I don't want to be pregnant right now, right? I might want to have children, but just not right now. And unintended pregnancies are associated with negative health behaviors, such as delayed prenatal care, Right, which makes sense because if you're not intending to get pregnant, right, or you don't even know you're pregnant for a long time because you're not intending to get pregnant, you'll have delayed prenatal care, right? You won't be going to the doctor beforehand, making sure you're okay because you're not intending to. It's most likely resulted from an accident. It's also associated with inadequate weight gain, smoking, and alcohol and other drug use, which again, if you're not intending to get pregnant or you don't know you're pregnant, smoking or using alcohol or other drugs might be part of your normal behaviors, right? You might drink with friends casually, and it wouldn't be surprising to do that if you did not know you were pregnant, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be intentionally harmful. So the Title 10 of Public Health Service 
was signed into law by President Nixon in 1970. And this was to provide family planning services to all that wanted them, but that could not afford them. Okay, so the aim was to reduce unintended pregnancy by providing contraceptive birth control and other reproductive health care services to low income women. Okay. So for over four decades, Title 10 has been this nation's major program to reduce unintended pregnancies. They also provide, like it says, reproductive health care services such as screening for sexually transmitted infections, STIs, to low income women. It currently provides funding to support a network of 4,100 family planning centers nationwide. Every year, approximately 4 million women receive health care services at family planning clinics funded by Title X. Those served are predominantly female, poor, uninsured, and have never had a child. And these services are provided through the state, county, and local health departments, community centers, Planned Parenthood centers, and hospital, school, and some faith-based organizations. So again, this is a community-wide effort, right, to help women family plan. So when we're evaluating the success of community health family planning programs, we see that clinics can improve maternal, infant, and child health indicators. They have shown large reductions in unintended pregnancies, abortions, and births. Okay. Each year, publicly subsidized family planning clinics help prevent almost 2 million unpre unplanned pregnancies that would result in 860,000 unintended births, 810,000 abortions, and 270,000 miscarriages. And each public health dollar spent saves three dollars and 74 cents in Medicaid costs. Okay, so every dollar we put into preventing these pregnancies, we're saving almost four dollars in Medicaid costs. The Medicaid, right, women often get on this when they're pregnant or uninsured. They get on it because it helps low income women, right, through pregnancy. Now today, one of these clinics that's the most successful is the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Right. This has grown to be the largest voluntary reproductive health care organization in the world, and it is dedicated to the principle that every woman has the fundamental right to choose when or whether to have children. This not-for-profit organization serves nearly 5 million women and men each year. And currently, Planned Parenthood operates approximately 700 health centers and is estimated that their services advert over half a million unintended pregnancies each year, right? Again, by providing these educational programs, contraception, and family planning programs. So now we're gonna talk about abortion. And I know this is a touchy subject for some people, but we're gonna talk about the facts. And I just wanna have a couple precursors to abortion before I start talking about this, okay? So as I said earlier, right, we want to reduce teenage pregnancy. Right, that's an objectively good thing. Okay, we want to reduce unwanted, unintended pregnancies because those result in abortion. Right, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, it is a positive thing to reduce the rate of abortions. Okay, it's not a positive thing to take it away, but to reduce it. Right, we're just talking about reducing it. So, everybody on every side of the spectrum wants to reduce the rate of abortion. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about it, right? So one of the most important outcomes of family and community planning is preventing abortions. Abortion has been legal throughout the United States since 1973, when the Supreme Court ruled in Roe v. Wade the case that women, in consultation with their physician, have a constitutionally protected right to have an abortion in the first trimester of pregnancy, free from government in interference. Since 1969, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has been documenting the number and characteristics of women obtaining legal induced abortions to monitor unintended pregnancy and to assist with efforts to identify and reduce preventable causes of morbidity and mortality associated with abortions. Right? If we want to improve the situation, we need to see what the data is first. Right? We need to take a needs assessment, see what's happening. 
As a result of Roe v. Wade, the number of women dying from illegal abortions has diminished sharply during the last three decades in the United States. Okay. So as it has become legal and accepted, the rates of death from illegal abortions have decreased. Almost, it's almost non-existent now. Okay. However, doubters remain, largely among those whose main strategy for reducing abortion is to outlaw it. And although it may seem paradoxical, the legal status of abortion appears to have relatively little connection to its overall pervasiveness. I'm going to say this one more time. Okay. The legal status of abortion appears to have relatively little connection to its overall pervasiveness. Now, what I'm saying is that even if it is made illegal, it, that has no effect on the number that are occurring. Okay. So whether it's legal, semi-legal, totally legal, women are still getting abortions. Now, the issue of abortion has become a hotly debated topic. Political appointments can be won or lost depending on a candidate's stance as pro-life or pro-choice on the abortion issue. Okay. Pro-life groups believe that life begins at conception and that an embryo is a person. Therefore, they conclude that performing an abortion is an act of murder. Okay. The pro-choice position is that women have the right to reproductive freedom. Pro-choice advocate that Pro-choice advocates, excuse me, think that the government should not be allowed to force a woman to carry to term and give birth to an unwanted child. Evidence shows that laws against abortion do not correspond with lower rates of abortion. In fact, the highest rates of abortion occur in countries where the practice is illegal, and the lowest rates are in countries where it is legal and access to contraception, birth control, is high. This suggests that access to contraception and corresponding declines in unintended pregnancy are the most effective means to reducing abortion. I'm going to say this again. This suggests that access to contraception and corresponding declines in unintended pregnancy are the most effective means to reducing abortion. In countries where abortion is illegal, women may resort to dangerous methods to terminate the pregnancy. Unsafe abortions are a significant contributor to maternal death. There are also extenuating circumstances such as rape or danger to the mother if she continues to carry the child, which makes the issue less clear, makes it less black and white for people. The effects of pregnancy and childbirth on women is an important indicator of health. Okay? Pregnancy and delivery can lead to serious health problems for women, and this could result in a maternal death. So the International Classification of Diseases, or the ICD-10, defines a maternal death or maternal mortality as the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of the, of the duration and the site of the pregnancy, from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy and its management, but not from accidental or incidental causes. Okay. So a maternal death is the death of a woman while pregnant, or if she terminates the pregnancy, or we have a situation that causes the fetus to die prematurely. If she dies within 42 days of that, that's still con considered a maternal death. right? And if the death is linked directly to pregnancy. If it is some kind of accident, like a car crash, that would not be considered a maternal death. So maternal mortality and morbidity rates is the number of mothers dying per 100,000 live births in any given year. And this includes poverty and limited education as potential causes. So preconception and prenatal health care. Preconception care is medical care provided to women of reproductive age to promote health prior to conception. Okay, this could be your general checkup, making sure you're overall healthy, getting pap smears right regularly. And prenatal health care refers to medical care from time of conception until the birth process. And usually during this time, right, you go to an OBGYN or an obstetrician gynecologist. Early and continuous preconception and prenatal care leads to better pregnancy outcomes. And those that do this are less likely to give birth to a low weight baby. 
Here's the timing of prenatal care by initiation by maternal education, or prenatal care initiation by maternal education, sorry, from 2012. So you can see that we have the first trimester in orange, second trimester in pink, and the third trimester, or no care, in blue. Okay. So this is the first time they go to the doctor. Okay. So you can see, if we look at less than a high school diploma, 58.5% of mothers go during the first trimester, and 30% go during the second trimester, and 11% either go during the third trimester or no, have no care at all. Okay. So we really want to minimize the blue and the pink, and we want most mothers to go to the doctor as early as possible when pregnant. Okay. Now let's say they have a bachelor's degree or higher. That rate jumps up from 58 to 86 percent of mothers go to the doctor during the first trimester, 11 percent during their second, and 2 percent go during their third trimester or don't get any care at all. Now here's a checklist for preconception health. So I'll just read a couple of these, right? We want to plan pregnancies, eat healthy foods, be active, take vitamins, try to avoid STDs, other infections, harmful chemicals, make sure you have all your vaccinations, manage your stress, stop smoking, don't use illicit drugs, reduce alcohol intake before trying to get pregnant, and cease drinking alcohol while pregnant. Manage health conditions, learn about your family's history, and get regular checkups. Now, an infant's health depends on many factors, which include the mother's health and her health behavior prior to and during pregnancy, genetic characteristics, level of prenatal care, the quality of her delivery, and the infant's environment after health or after birth. The infant's environment includes not only the home and family environment, but also the availability of essential medical services such as postnatal physical examination, regular visits to a physician, and the appropriate immunizations. The infant's health also depends on proper nutrition and other nurturing care in the home environment. Shortcomings in these areas can result in illness, developmental problems, and even the death of a child. Infant death is an important measure of the nation's health because it is associated with a variety of factors such as maternal health, quality of access to medical care, socioeconomic conditions, and public health practices. An infant death or infant mortality is the death of a child younger than one year. The infant mortality rate is expressed as the number of deaths of children younger than one year per 1,000 live births. Infant deaths or infant mortality can be further divided into neonatal mortality and postneonatal mortality. Neonatal mortality includes deaths that occurred during the first 28 days after birth. Okay, so from birth to 28 days, that's neonatal mortality. Postneonatal mortality includes deaths that occur between 28 days and 365 days after birth. Okay, so after the first few weeks, that's considered post-neonatal. Approximately two-thirds or 66% of all inf infant deaths take place during this neonatal period within the first four weeks. The most common causes of neonatal death are disorders related to short gestation, giving birth prematurely, and low birth weight, congenital malformations, meaning a malformation you were, they were born with, and complications of pregnancy. So in order to improve infant health, there is currently no way of predicting which infants will die because of SIDS. However, research has so shown that sleeping on the back all the time rather than the stomach or side greatly decreases the risk of SIDS. In response to this research, the federal government initiated a national Safe to Sleep campaign, which began in 1994 as the Back to Sleep campaign to educate parents and health professionals that placing babies on their backs to sleep can reduce the risk of SIDS. Since the dissemination of the recommendation, more infants have been put to bed on their backs and the rate of SIDS has fallen by more than 50%. 
And you can see here on the scale, right, we have the SIDS rate in blue, which you can see has decreased, and the percent of back sleeping, which has increased. And you can see the sharp increase from 1996. So children are less likely to become produ productive members of society if they grow up in poverty, live in a violent environment, have poor or mediocre childcare, or have no health insurance. Failure to provide timely and remedial care leads to unnecessary illness, disability, and death, events that are associated with much greater cost than the timely care itself. So good health during a child's years are essential to a child's optimal development and a medical home is recommended. And this concept, which is the provision of continuous, comprehensive, coordinated, family-oriented care. The physician should not only address routine health issues and make sure the child has his or her recommended immunization, but they should also discuss growth and development, parenting, nutrition, safety, and psychosocial issues that may affect the child. So childhood mortality is one of the most severe measures of health in children. The rates have generally declined in the past few decades, and unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death in children. In fact, most, I'm sorry, in fact, unintentional injuries kill more children than all diseases combined. The overwhelming majority of unintentional injury deaths among children are the result of motor vehicle crashes and many of these deaths could be prevented with appropriate use of child restraints, such as seatbelts or car seats. In 2013, 43% of children fatally injured in motor vehicle accidents were unrestrained. Car seats reduced the likelihood of fatal injury in passenger cars by 71% for infants and by 54% for children aged one to four. However, in 2013, 278 fatalities occurred in passenger vehicles among children who were four or younger, and 31% of those for whom restraint use was known were not restrained in any manner. So along with unintentional injuries, which have a significant economic, emotional, and disabling impact, other reasons for childhood mortality include child maltreatment and infectious diseases. Both of these require strong community responses, and infectious diseases emphasizes the importance of immunization schedules, as in getting certain vaccines at certain times throughout childhood. And most of this is encouraged by public schools, where you have to have certain vaccinations before you can attend school. Here's how America ranks among industrialized countries in investing and protecting children. Okay. So we're the first in gross domestic product, GDP, first in the number of billionaires, and we're the second to worst in child poverty rates. Okay. We have the largest gap between the rich and the poor. We spend the most money on weapons, military, and we're first in the number of people incarcerated. We're the worst in protecting children against gun violence. We're the 30th in preschool enrollment rates, 24th in reading scores for 15-year-olds, 28th in science scores for 15-year-olds, and 36th in math scores for 15-year-olds. We spend the most money on health, and we're the 25th in low birth weight rates, 26th in immunization rates, and 31st in infant mortality rates. And we're the second to worst country in teenage births. In the preceding slides, many problems associated with maternal, infant, and child health have, have been identified. Solutions for many of these problems have been proposed, and in many cases, programs are already in place. Some of these programs are aimed at preventing or reducing the levels of maternal and infant morbidity, morbidity and mortality, whereas others are aimed at the prevention or reduction of childhood morbidity and mortality. So the federal government has over 35 programs and 16 different agencies to serve the needs of nation's children. Many are categorical pro programs, which means that they're only available to people who fit a specific group. Therefore, many fall through the cracks. So a specific group could be based on a disease, 
age, geography, financial need, or other variables. And again, this means that many children fall through the cracks and are not served based on their needs. So the Title V, the Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC program, is a clinic-based program designed to provide a variety of nutritional and health-related goods and services to pregnant, postpartum, breastfeeding women, infants up to one year of age, and children under the age of five. It began as a pilot program in 1972 and received permanent federal funding in 1974. And this was in response to growing evidence linking nutritional inadequacies to mental and physical health defects. Pregnant or postpartum women, infants, and children up to the age of five are eligible if they meet the following three criteria. First, they have to reside in a state in which they are applying. That is, if I live in Mississippi, I have to apply to the Mississippi WIC program. There are certain income requirements. The applicant must have a household income at or below 185% of the federal poverty income guidelines means I have to be substantially below the poverty level. And three, I have to have a determination to be at nutritional risk by a health professional. So you have to have your doctor sign off. Since WIC's inception as a national nutrition program, it has grown dramatically. In 1974, the average number of monthly WIC participants was 88,000. In 2014, that number was just over 9 million women, infants, and children. Among WIC participants, children make up one half, infants make up one quarter, and women make up one quarter. Here are the breastfeeding initiation rates by state for WIC infant participants aged 6 to 13 months. And you can see that the lighter states have less breastfeeding occurring, darker states have more breastfeeding occurring. So all children deserve to start life on the right track and have access to comprehensive health services that provide preventative care when they are well and treatment when they are ill or injured. Now, health insurance provides access to critical preventative medical services as well as acute medical care in the case of in illness or injury. Right? So when compared with children who are privately insured or have governmental insurance, Children without health insurance are much more, much more likely to have necessary care delayed or receive no care for health problems, which puts them at a greater risk for hospitalization. Therefore, providing health insurance to low-income children is a critical health care safety net. Now, the government has two principal programs aimed at preventing health care coverage to low-income children. The Medicaid program and the State Children's Health Insurance Program, which is called CHIP. Medicaid was created in 1965 and provides medical assistance to certain low-income individuals and families, most of which is women and children. Medicaid is the single largest provider of health insurance for children in the United States and provides health coverage for over 33 million children. Although the Medicaid program is a critical health care program, being poor does not automatically qualify a child for Medicaid. Medicaid eligibility is determined by each state based on various age and income requirements. As a result, Medicaid coverage varies across the states and leaves a significant number of poor children uninsured. To broaden the coverage to low-income children, Congress created CHIP under provisions in the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Although parents should accept the primary responsibility for raising their children, the government can assist families who need help making important investments. Two important investments into the health and welfare of America's children involve support for parenting during the first months of life and supporting the child's need for secure relationships with a small number of adults in safe settings as they develop during the first few years of life. The Family and Medical Leave Act was signed into law in 1993 and provides job protection for individuals for medical or family-related needs, including support for new parents. The Family Medical Leave Act 
grants 12 weeks of unpaid job protected leave to men or women after the birth of a child, an adoption, or in the event of illness in the immediate family. However, the FMLA only affects businesses with more than 50 employees. Those employees covered by the law include those who have worked 1,250 hours for an employer over a 12-month period, an average of 25 hours per week. This excludes about 40% of American employees who work in small businesses and that do not fall under the law's guidelines. This Leave Act can also exempt key salaried employees who are among their highest paid 10%. For many families, especially those with low and moderate incomes, high quality, affordable childcare is simply not available. The average cost of care for an infant ranges from $5,500 to $16,500 per year in a center-based setting and $4,500 to $10,700 per year in a family-based center with a wide range across states. The costs decrease as a, child, as a child gets older. However, parents often pay for child care for more than one child at a time. These costs are beyond the reach of many working parents, half of whom earn $35,000 a year or less. The lack of high quality child care prevents children from entering school ready to learn, hinders their success in school, and limits the ability of their parents to be productive workers. Along with this high cost of child care, the Child Care and Development Block Grant is a subsidy for child care, meaning it helps parents pay for child care. But due to limited resources, only one out of every five children in need receive it. Now there are other advocates for children's health and welfare, and among them are the Children's Defense Fund, UNICEF, or United Nations Children Fund, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. All of these organizations take initiative to ensure the health and wellness of children in the United States. So here are some discussion questions to help you think about this lesson. What are some ways community programs can increase participation in early prenatal care services? What kind of impact do programs such as WIC have on community health outcomes? <laughs> 